And if you can open your Bibles um, to Luke chapter 6, we're going to read from verses 46 to 49, and the page numbers on the screen, 1034. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. This is the word of the Lord. The second reason comes from Psalm 1, page 543. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the Lord is the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. And let me pray as I begin. Father, we pray that you would be so merciful to us tonight. We've sung some amazing words and um, we've prayed some great prayers together. Father, we praise your name um, that Jesus Christ died um, for us. He died so that we could be called your people. And yet, Father, as we come to your word tonight, um, we see a great warning um, that not everybody who calls Jesus Lord actually treats him as their Lord. So would your Holy Spirit work amongst us tonight, Father, to soften our hearts, that everyone in this room, everyone gathered here, might be able to truly say that Jesus Christ is his or her Lord, for your glory and for your name's sake. Amen. Well, you've got a handout, hopefully, in front of you. And as I begin, um, let me read a part of a newspaper article to you. Here we go. In 2010, an earthquake of terrifying proportions hit the Republic of Haiti. Thousands were killed, whole villages annihilated, and the capital turned into a wasteland of ruins and suffering. For geologist Claude Prepity, it was validation of the worst possible kind. Since 1998, researchers had been predicting a major earthquake in the region at some point, with such a vague prediction, it's almost understandable that officials ignored them. But Prepity had taken that original research and made it frighteningly relevant. The quake, he was convinced, would hit Haiti worst, where the number of illegally constructed buildings in Port-au-Prince would turn his country's capital into a vast cemetery. Over the course of a frantic year, Prepity wrote papers on the subject, spoke before international audiences, and contacted government officials directly. But Haiti's leaders simply didn't listen. When they could have been spending money to tear down unstable buildings and construct earthquake-proof ones, they were instead blowing the budget on expensive 4 by 4s to cruise around in. Finally, on January the 12th, 2010, the inevitable happened. Well, there are warnings that people listen to, and then there are warnings that people ignore. And I suppose a lot of the weight of a warning, um, it comes down to the credibility of the one who is issuing it. In Luke chapter 6, God, clothed in human flesh, 
issues a stark warning to some builders about a flood that is most certainly coming. This warning coming from the mouth of the God who knows the end from the beginning, well, it should have one of two effects on anyone who claims that Jesus Christ is their Lord. Um, We are each tonight to do a survey of how we are building. And Jesus' warning should either bring us great confidence and assurance to continue the building work, or else it should cause us to tear down our unstable building and begin to build what will last. To step out the door tonight with any other course of action um, in our heart is utter foolishness, like buying a new Range Rover just before an earthquake. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Well, that's an extremely sobering question um, to begin with. But actually, in verse 47 to 48, Jesus starts by showing us that some people call Jesus Lord and do treat him as Lord. And immediately before we get any dire warnings, um, these are the people who we surely want to be numbered amongst And we want to be included among the people who call Jesus Lord and actually treat him as Lord. When I call Jesus Lord, I think I mean it. I really hope I mean it. Who are the people that both call Jesus Lord and treat him as Lord? Well, Jesus says it is everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. Those people are the builders whose house is going to last because it has a foundation deep down in the rock. Those people are Christians. Now, is that how you would define a Christian? As someone who goes to Jesus, hears his words, and puts them into practice? If that's not our definition of a Christian, well then, should we be quite worried? Um, Since our definition is different um, from the one given us by Christ. Whenever I was um, head of maths, um, I remember one of the teachers in the department was off at a course one day, so I went to take her class. I went to take her year seven class. They were quite new to the school. I went to teach them some fractions. Pretty good at teaching fractions and all this stuff. So um, I stood at the front of the room. I went through the method, and I could see their faces getting more and more confused all the time. Eventually, a hand went up, um, and the question was put, Sir are you even a maths teacher? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm the head of maths. <laughs> you know, I'm teaching you the right thing. I don't know what your teacher's been teaching you anyway. We should be very careful. Our definition of a Christian agrees with Christ, shouldn't we? Um, and so what we want to know is, what does this real Christianity look like? Well, here's what it's not. It's not like studying for an exam. Now, some of you won't remember this. Um, It's been a long time, hasn't it, Scott? But when you're trying to gain a qualification, um, there's a lot expected of you. Um, Essays and coursework, and then as much revision as you can possibly cram in, um, so that on the day, a sufficient amount of knowledge can be poured out onto the paper, and you can somehow scrape the pass mark. Most of us here, we're getting on okay with the Christian coursework, aren't we? Church attendance, being on some rotas, maybe some quiet times, chuck in a baptism and maybe some prayer meetings, and the portfolio looks okay, doesn't it? I reckon the overwhelming percentage of us here in the room tonight would probably pass the orthodoxy test at the end as well. Maybe some questions on who Jesus is, why a three-leaf clover is a bad description of the Trinity, um, what the cross and the empty tomb means for sin and death. I reckon we would absolutely nail that exam, the vast proportion of people who are sitting here tonight. So if we would win, if we would, if we would beat that exam, if we would pass that exam, does that mean we are Christians? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that at all, does it? You see, we can go to Jesus, we can hear his words, we could commit them all brilliantly to memory, We could be able to write books and PhDs on the subject and yet never actually put them into practice. 
Jesus doesn't describe Christianity as an exam, but rather as a relationship. And, and the relationship that he is describing here is the relationship of a master with his servant. He has the authority, and those who are calling him Lord um, should not only listen to his words, but they should obey them. Now, we've got so much of God's word here on tap um, that our attitude, I think, to Jesus' words can get quite casual. Um, On Wednesday night in our prayer and praise, we were praising God for some of the Iranian men um, who are part of a Bible study um, with Rich at the minute and who turn up to those studies every week with pages of notes on the passages that they have been reading. As we read these words of Jesus... If we were going to take them really seriously, um, then urgently we might start scrolling back in the book of Luke to see what words Jesus is actually talking about um, to put into practice. If we really were listening to his words as if they were a warning to us, we might immediately start scrolling back and think, well, what exactly is Jesus talking about? And you don't need to go back too far in Luke to see that this relationship of lordship that Jesus is to have should completely transform our lives. So if you would, go back in your Bibles, and stay in this chapter, but go back to verse 20 of chapter 6. And let's read some of Jesus' words together. Verse 20, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that's how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you'll go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. You can't help but notice that there are two completely different lives described here. And only one of them brings God's blessing, and only one of them leads to rejoicing. And so as you read, as you survey the house that you are building with your life, Look, you can be filled with assurance that Jesus is indeed the Lord of your life if your life is so tied to the master um, that it looks like verses 20 to 23. As you read those verses, um, they can bring you great assurance. Do you want to test the quality of your foundations? Well, there's a number of things you could look at. Um, There's a number of things you could look at to see if you're being transformed by Jesus. But for the sake of time, let's just look at one of them now. Let's take the hate test in verse 23. Are there people in your life who exclude you or insult you because they associate you so closely with the name of Jesus? That because is important, isn't it? They can't just hate you um, because you're an annoying person um, or whatever. Um, but are there people who hate you um, and treat you badly? I don't think much if you don't want to spend much time with you um, because they associate you so closely with the name of Jesus. If so, well, then you should be filled with confidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. Filled with confidence that you belong to Jesus Christ. In fact, more than just being filled with confidence, you should rejoice, even as you're bearing their rejection and hate, because what a future you have to look forward to. You are putting his words into practice. So you're not simply trying to remember the right words for an exam that's coming up at some point. No, you've got a relationship with Jesus where he is your master, and you're being transformed by that relationship. See, you're calling Jesus Lord, and you're treating him as Lord. But there are some people who call Jesus Lord, and they don't treat him 
as Lord. And according to Jesus, a person like that, is, it's, it's the one who hears my words and do not put them into practice. But notice that these people, they're also builders. And the house that they're building, it doesn't probably look any different um, from any other house. I suppose it could even look grander and fancier. It doesn't really matter. They're building as well. But the house they're building has got a serious problem. There's absolutely no foundation. It's not being built on the rock. Now, at this point, remember that Jesus is not teaching or shouting this to a load of closed doors because people aren't interested in what he has to say. No, he's speaking to people who are already calling him Lord people who hear his words but aren't putting them into practice, people who think they will pass an exam, um, whose relationship with Jesus is not one of servant and master. They're not being transformed by his authoritative teaching. Why why should the the, uh, the consequences of this way of life, why should they be so disastrous? Well, it's because by living this way, People are treating Jesus' name with contempt. Earlier in the history of God's people, um, the prophet Malachi had challenged Israel because their behavior was doing just that. And this is what you can read in Malachi 1 verse 6. A a son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due to me? If I am a master, where is the respect due to me? says the Lord Almighty. You see, call Jesus Lord all you want, but if his words are just flying in one ear and out the other, then that question is the thing that should be left ringing in your ears. If I am a master, where is the respect due to me? Should anyone treat Jesus in this way? But come on, though, this is St. John's, isn't it? I mean, how on earth would people like us actually manage to do that? Well, perhaps there are some of us here who are simply outright hypocrites. Maybe there is some amongst us who know that Jesus isn't their Lord, but just like pretending he is because of what you get out of it. Maybe a sense of community or some purpose, some good friends something to do on a Sunday. However, you can get all of those things elsewhere, can't you? So I can't imagine that there are many like this amongst us who know they don't belong to Jesus, but are pretending to others that they do. I can't imagine that there's many of us here like that tonight. I think it's much more likely that there are some here with selective deafness and when it comes to Jesus' words. There are things we like which we will happily listen to and happily proclaim to others. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a great one, isn't it? Well said, Jesus. Like, I totally agree with you on that one. That's not a response to lordship, though, is it? That, that's finding that somebody else agrees with what you think already, at least in principle anyway. That's not lordship. I felt a bit like that myself this week as I was preparing to preach on Romans 1 um, verses 18 to 32. Riverside has had it already. St. John's, you've got that to look forward to um, next week. But there were bits this week as I was preparing to preach, you know, I would have preferred to leave out. Bits about the terribleness of sin, maybe bits about sexuality, bits about God's anger that often people don't like hearing. But what am I going to build on? Am I going to build on the rock that is Christ or the shaky ground that keeps people happy for a while? See, what bits do you not like to listen to? Um, What parts of Jesus' teaching test your response to his lordship? You see, we're not treating Jesus as Lord if we only do what he says to do whenever it suits us or whenever we agree with him. A master gets to be obeyed, whilst a servant is to do the obeying. 
So there might be some that are outright hypocrites. Maybe many more might be selectively deaf. But all who call Jesus Lord but don't do what he says, all people like that demonstrate utter stupidity. In Matthew 7, we get a couple of extra adjectives. I mean, you might have been thinking, where's the word wise and where's the word foolish? But if you go to Matthew 7, this same account, you get those two extra adjectives in this teaching. You get the wise man and you get the fool. What fools we would be to sit under the faithful teaching of God's word in this place for year after year, to hear of the God who loves us enough to die for us, to listen to countless arguments for why God's ways are better than our ways, to see others sitting around us who are living under Christ's lordship, and yet to let all that pass us by, assuming that, well, we're fine, really. I was talking to a friend about this passage this week, and he was talking about um, his wife constantly telling him to check his tickets before they go anywhere so they don't get there, um, and he suddenly realizes he's messed it up. And it, it got me thinking about an episode of Grand Designs that I, I remember watching. Um, in gra- this episode, a couple had spent, I think, nearly half a million pounds um, doing up a thatched cottage in the New Forest, only for the roof to catch fire and for the house to burn down. Now, as that man watched his house burn into the ground, he checked his house insurance. He realized that it had run out and it hadn't been renewed, and he was promptly sick. Imagine telling your wife that. Like, what a fool. And what a terrible time to find out your foolishness. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't ignore what you don't like. And don't be utterly stupid. Come to Jesus, hear his words, and put them into practice. Because whether we call Jesus Lord and treat him as Lord, or whether we call him Lord and don't treat him as Lord, the truth is that Jesus is Lord. And because he is Lord, there is a flood coming. A flood may come in this life, I met a man at the start of the summer who was in a terrible place in life. Everything had collapsed. His marriage was destroyed. His kids were all over the place. And he himself was on the verge of prison. This was a man who had been to church for a while. But he had done what he wanted to do with his life rather than doing what Jesus commanded him to do. A flood had come and had wrecked everything that he had built. And then there's a man in Riverside Church up the road. And he had spent years following Jesus as his master. But a flood came for him too just before the summer and his beloved wife was taken to be with her Lord and he was left behind to pick up the many pieces. But the house he was building, well, it still stands because its foundations were deep in Jesus Christ. A flood may come in this life But the flood will certainly come in the day of judgment. Um, On that day, it won't matter how grand looking the house is that you were building. It won't matter if there are turrets and extensions and a beautiful garden out front. It will only matter that you have built deep down on the rock that is Jesus Christ. And if you haven't, then as Psalm 1 said, I'm in our other reading, therefore the wicked will not stand in the day of judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. This very evening, and in the week coming, the days the days are about to come, survey the house you are building. If it's got no foundation, look, don't spend time trying to make it look any better. Come to Jesus Christ and repent, and with the help of the Holy Spirit. Treat Jesus as your Lord. Tear that unstable structure down and begin today to build what will last forever. But you know, if you are carrying out your survey and you are getting great confidence that Jesus is your Lord and has been for a while, well then praise God. Praise him for the cross and the empty tomb. Praise him for the foundation 
that you have in Jesus Christ. These are words that we sang earlier. Fear not, he is with us, so be not dismayed, for he is our God, our sustainer and strength. He'll be our defender and cause us to stand, upheld by his merciful almighty hand. How firm our foundation, how sure our salvation, and we will not be shaken. Jesus, firm foundation. As you survey tonight, tomorrow, this week, as you survey the house that you're building, if you have confidence that as you call Jesus Lord, He is your Lord, praise God um, for he, all that He has done for you. Praise God for Christ's death on the cross and for the empty tomb that gives you a foundation. That means your house can never be shaken whether the flood comes in this life or whether it comes at the end. And continue the good building work. Let me pray. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts. We pray you would be merciful to us again for our good and for your glory. We pray that your word will have one of those two effects on us tonight and over these coming days, that as we look at the house that we are building, as we look at our relationship with Jesus, Father, either that we would have great confidence that Jesus is indeed our Lord. We go to him, we listen to his words and put them into practice. Or else, Father, we would be people who are caused to fall on our knees in repentance, come to you and ask for that great foundation and start building a house that will last forever. Praise your name for Jesus Christ and may he be glorified in our response to your word. Amen.